uh, or Sam. And um, there has just been um, a terrible, tragic events in Half Moon Bay. People have been killed. And um, so there's a lot going on in Half Moon Bay, murdered actually with guns. And um, so Half Moon Bay will not be attending our meeting tonight. As such, I um, think we should just um, go to the uh, go. We're not. I had promised Half Moon Bay we would not um, have any, take any votes on anything. We will have a uh, special meeting to do that, and they have said yes. They have no objections to having a special meeting. Um, that said we had item 4b on the agenda which is an information item about the status of the plant after the storm and what damages happened and what what the engineers are saying it's it's um a story that i think a lot of folks want to be informed on not that i see a lot of them here but they might tune in later um and it's an important story about emergency preparedness. And also, um, I will say once again about our excellent uh, staff who um, came to, who, who were able to keep the plant from totally blowing, and the system. Because Sam is much more than a little plant, a little plant. Um, super treatment plant. It includes um, a lot of pipelines, and there were problems and sewer spills and so on. And so, I want to keep folks on top of um, what's going on on with that because the story will be changing um, sooner every week. This the story will be changing. We have engineers involved. We have all kinds of, of different events involved. And so let's just skip. Uh, we, we'll go to public comment and then we will skip the consent agenda and move on. Jeremy so, wants to speak. Yeah, if I could real quick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so because of the way that the JPA agreement is set up, um, with votes allocated to the city versus the other two member agencies. We don't technically have a quorum this evening. So this technically we're not actually having a meeting, but staff is providing and the is providing information because the public is attending, which is fine. Um, and just, just, I had mentioned this before we officially started, um, no need to have a, um, emergency work, but that can occur at the next regular board meeting because technically we're not, and that's why I'm making the point, technically we're actually having a meeting, a regular meeting tonight because we don't have a quorum. But that doesn't mean you can't provide the great information that uh, that you're looking to provide, Chair Sarah Carter. Right, and, and um, I will say that if staff feels like it needs direction, um, then I am not will not be shy to call a special meeting because we want to keep staff uh, trusting the fact that this is an urgent project um, to get these things repaired and we don't want to sl be slow for any reason. We have a water board and other interested environmental attorneys who are watching us and we need to be on top of this. So thank you. Uh, public comment, I see Aaron's iPad. Is Aaron there? I am, thank you. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to uh, compliment the SAM staff uh, with dealing with all the different issues that are happening. Um, you know, when I first came to Sewer Authority Midcoast, I was uh, really surprised at uh, the, the skeleton crew that we have here. Um, we are able to get so much done with the limited amount of people that we have. Uh, it's it's incredible to me, honestly. Um, the mechanics work their butts off. 
the collections crew is phenomenal. Um, the operators are all willing and hardworking and wanting to know more. I mean, it is just amazing. Um, I'm impressed with our management staff who are willing to sacrifice and give extra time, jump in where there's needed. Um, with the whole emergency, I wouldn't have wanted anybody else being my leader there other than Kishin and Tim. Um, they were helping us and fighting hard to get the things that we needed. Um, you know, there's there's been some interesting public comments and thoughts, and I don't want to get too political with this, um, but it was a miracle that the plant did not die. Now, could we have foreseen that the uh, Pillar Citos Creek was going to swell to its largest size in I don't know how many different years and have a one in 100 year flood? Probably not. But if we did, we definitely need more resources. We need more money and we need more people to help us have the infrastructure and then the staff to take care of that infrastructure. And so I, I think it's really important that we look at that as, a, as an aspect for prevention of major issues happening in the future. But again, just cannot compliment Kishin, Tim, and the whole SVCW crew for responding and doing the best they could to make sure that this didn't get worse. So just one yeah, yeah. Well said, Aaron. I think we all agree with that. We do. Exactly. Barbara? Um, uh, Kitchen, do you need the contract with Pacific Pipeline ratified? Or, uh, and Jeremy, I guess, um, or is it okay to let it go after tonight? I mean, do we need yeah. to have a special meeting for that? We can't ratify it anyway. That's I right. know. But I'm asking Kishin how what the timeline is for that contract if there are issues with not having action until our next board meeting. No issues. We take it for ratification of the next meeting. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, Want that work to continue. I do not see any more hands up. Um, let me get to the agenda. There we go. So we will skip through the consent agenda, save that, and regular business item 4A we will skip, and 4B1, or 4B, we will go on to the, uh, the one we're skipping for late to the next meeting is um, ratify the contract with Bay Pacific Pipeline to complete the emergency repair of the force main in an amount not to exceed $447,000. The one we will be hearing is the update on the emergency storm situation and actions taken by SAM to prevent and mitigate harm to the SAM facilities. Part one is update the current status of repairs and replacements necessitated by recent extreme uh, storms and flooding. And two, there is no vote uh, on the uh, contract, so we will just stick to um, item 4B1. Thank you. Keishan. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, so giving an update on the emergency storm situation. Um, I know uh, we made a presentation at the last board meeting giving uh, photographs of areas where the flooding took place. We played a video. And we repeated it again at the um, Montara meeting. So most of you would have already seen it. But uh, still, I put together a few slides to talk about the storm event because uh, there are a lot of things going on in either social media or in different meetings that it was, I mean, in our presentation, we use dramatic language that we missed the disaster by moments and that it was a miracle that the whole plant did not shut down. Of course, it was a miracle with the type of flooding that took place. Uh, it did not shut down. And we were also told that maybe we should have been more proactive instead of after the fact. Well, who knew that such a storm would be coming? So I would like to, um, I've done some research and got some data about the different type of storms going as far back as 1906. And I'd like to share the data so that uh, misconceptions, misinformation uh, can be made, uh, you know, can be ratified and easily uh, clarified. And uh, I wanted the public to be aware about it. So that's why I put together this presentation. If I may 
share my screen. Just a few slides. Okay, so the 1231 uh, storm, Bay Area experienced one of the biggest storms of the past 100 plus years. So that particular day was the third wettest in the record that goes back to 1906. So looking at all the, um, the uh, maximum one day total precipitation, the wettest day on record was on 10-30-1962, and that was 4.88 inches. Now we try to do, this is from the uh, NWS, uh, National Weather Service uh, Bay Area website that we got information. We could get Redwood City, we could get San Francisco. And for some reason, we couldn't get uh, Half Moon Bay. That's still not up on their uh, website. But this is statistical data which we are uh, able to collect. So on 12:31, we got uh, Redwood City. There was about maximum one day total precipitation was 4.47. There has been higher uh, precipitations in the past, like 1962 was 4.88, 1967 was 4.88. And about San Francisco downtown, the site hit 5.46 in the 24 hours of December 31st. This was actually the second wettest day in the 170 plus years of records. And uh, this is also about 46.8% of the monthly rainfall. So this was, this was not the worst, but it was one of the worst storms. Now, I also collected data that the wettest 10 day period for downtown San Francisco since 1871 uh, was actually 14.37 uh, in 1862. And after that, it was 10.33 and during this period from December 26th to January 4th. And uh, you all know that the federal government has, you know, has given out various grants. Or whatever. They are willing, they have actually approved California disaster declaration and all that stuff going on. So we are trying to pursue that. But to give you an idea from the uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, which is NOAA, and from the Half Moon Bay data that we gathered, you have in 1962, you had 4.9. 1982, you had 5.33. 1982, and in 2002, we had the maximum, which was 5.5. And on 1231, we had 5.38. And I would like to point out that none of these occasions when we had so high precipitation, we ever had the Pilar Citrus Creek overflowing into the plant. The, there was never a flood situation coming into the plant. So that being said, staff was fully unaware of such a thing happening. We were ready for all other storm events which could have happened but we're not aware about the, the water gushing from the creek coming into the plant, of which all of you have seen the pictures and the video that I shared in the last meeting. You all know that National Weather Service issued a flood warning at the morning of 31st, which was of course too late to respond because we started having, sorry, we started having flooding at 8.30 in the morning on 12.31. Now, flash floods are not predictable. Uh, they issued a flash flood warning, so flash floods are not predictable. Flooding, that, the definition of flash, oh shoot, sorry. The definition of flash flood is uh, the flooding that begins within six hours and often within three hours of the heavy rainfall. That's the way NWS defines it. Now, what could have happened is the creek has got years of drought led to dry, compacted creek bed with minimal vegetation. Added to that, we had the king tide, which reduced the ability of Pillar Citrus Creek to flow to the ocean. So that's the one which happened, and we got, we got all the flow coming into the plant, which flooded the plant, and you know what's happened, all the consequences. We've been facing um, a lot of equipment failures, repairs, and uh, replacements being done, uh, including the uh, pipeline failure, which happened on Valimar. And till date, we have crossed almost uh, $700,000 is the uh, POs that have been uh, sent out to various firms. Just And we are still uh, adding those figures. We are still accumulating. We are still evaluating equipments. 
to find out what needs to be fixed. And every day we come up with new electrical items where water would have gone and the motor is shorted or not, not working or the flow meters fail and several, several things going on. So I wanted to share this uh, part of the uh, storm situation with to the public to say that this was new and uh, not known, but so we did, a, we did our best possible and you've seen after the fact uh, what all the things we've done. And uh, of course, uh, the berm and other things did hold up. There was no overflow coming from the uh, creek and uh, with the rain, we were in a good shape after the fact. Now, to give an update about the pipeline, the Valimar uh, force main, the, the force main break, which was at Valimar, I just wanted to give an idea. We call it the Montara force main, although it does not belong to Montara, it belongs to Sam. It's just because of the location that it's located in Montara, we call it a Montara force main. The force main, which is uh, originating from Granada and Portola station, we call it Granada force main. But the entire IPS is owned by Sam. So to give you an idea about it, um, the first leg of the force main, which is about 2,505 feet, which is blue in color here, that was installed in 2015. So after that is where the break took place. So this new pipeline, which we installed in 2015, is all in good shape. It is HTPE, whereas after that, it is ductile iron pipe going all the way down here. So this portion failed here very close to this junction and that <clears throat> pipeline is being replaced. About 855 feet of, H of ductile iron pipe is being replaced by a 12 inch HTPE pipe. And that is being currently installed. As we speak, I'm going to give you an update about it in my next slides, but uh, this is the portion which is getting replaced. And further down, is the rest of the Montara force main, which comes to about 13,390 linear feet. That is all the way from here, going down to the junction structure here, where it becomes gravity. There's also another line which comes from Princeton pump station, and uh, it's called the Princeton force main. That is about 4,314 feet. That is of ductile iron pipe. We have had no histories of any failures in the past on the Princeton pump station, on the Princeton force main. And apparently the, uh, the assessment that we did shows that the ductile iron pipe is in good shape. Now, as I told you, we replaced the Valimar force main here, which is 25,205 feet. And we did have failures prior to 2015. And that's why a decision was taken that we should be changing that line. And the rest of it, after the gravity line, this is the gravity line. Uh, which is called the Montara Interceptor, which is about 2350 feet. And after that, you have the Portola pump station and further down from Portola station, all the way up to the gravity, we replaced it in the last couple of years. We replaced uh, about 1650 feet in 2013 and the balance 5,700 feet, we replaced it in 2018. So this is just the uh, history of the uh, IPS force main for those of you who who are not aware about what we are replacing and what is yet to be replaced. So this is the one which is uh, the uh, the balance 13,390 linear feet of the Montara force main is, we are yet to take a decision about replacing it, but uh, currently this is what the, the 855 feet is being taken up as emergency and the contractor worked on it uh, uh, the moment the uh, pipe break took place and we installed a pipeline, which is above ground, which is a temporary pipeline. And now we've hired Bay Pacific pipelines uh, on an emergency basis to replace the above ground pipeline to, um, uh, to a <coughs> 12, to replacing the 18, uh, replacing the 12 inch ductile iron pipe with a HTPE pipe. So the status of the project is the, as of, as we speak today, we completed the bypass piping, it got installed and passed the pressure test. So this is the pressure test that we do on the bypass. It goes to 100 PSI. This is the gauge which shows 100 PSI and we and it's tested with water. We uh, cap both the ends of the pipe and test it for 100 PSI, hold it for one hour and there was absolutely no leakage. 
Now on the same ground, we actually did the test last week on yellow on a pipe called yellow mine pipe. This is a bypass pipe. There were some couplings on the uh, pipe, and unfortunately, those failed. So we could not uh, move further with it, and therefore the contractor changed the bypass pipe to a totally different pipe from yellow mine to eight inch HDPE. He installed it yesterday, and we it passed the test today. But we still uh, uh, we will still be able to comply with the schedule what was uh, drawn earlier. We hope that um, tomorrow we will be having the tie in. We're planning on um, shutting it down for a couple of hours and do all the connections, the tie-in and connections, and then uh, the uh, actual force main fusing and installing will start starting from tomorrow, going on, going on to Friday, and we feel that that by we are confident that by 30th of uh, Jan we will be able to complete the uh, installing of the 12-inch uh, HDPE force main and all the bypass will be removed and paving and replacement will be done. Yes, Director Dai, you have a question? You're muted. Yeah. So yeah, sorry, um, this looks great. I'm glad all this work is getting done. Um, I'm just, I just wanted to clarify. So it, the, the problem that you had was with the, the above ground bypass piping? No, no it oh. was with the, it was with the pipe, it was with the, uh, you're right, but not with the above, not the above ground bypass, which was installed by the contractor when the break took place. Right. This is a temporary bypass where we have to remove the existing bypass, which was installed when the contractor um, addressed to the break. So the, because of the same location, we have to put the 12 inch uh, HDPE pipe. So we have to remove the, the pipe, which was installed by another contractor who did it on the day the pipeline broke. So in order to do above that, ground. Have to get, yeah, above ground. Did the above ground. So yeah. it's the eight inches, the above ground, and but the twelve inch um, below ground is it has passed all its tests. The twelve inch uh, below ground is what we're going to install starting tomorrow. Okay. So the eight inch bypass, which has been installed and tested today, is also above ground. It is adjacent to the eight eight inch bypass. It is adjacent to the. Uh, uh, 12 inch bypass, which was installed by uh, by another contractor when the pipe broke. Okay. Am I clear? Yeah. Or did I, I, I was just you? getting confused about the different pipes. So it sounds like um, all the important stuff is is moving along really well. Okay. Sorry. So this is these are pictures of uh, the pipe. This is the uh, bypass pipe, which. Uh, uh, the contractor, the present contractor, Bay Pacific, is in the process of installing. This is in the French, and that's it. I just thought I'll show you, sh share some pictures. Work is going on, and uh, they will provide more update at our next meeting. So, what's in the trench there? That's yeah, that's that's the pipe for getting ready for uh, the fusing it, and they're going to uh, they're going to start um, testing it, and then. Um, Start laying down the uh, twelve inch HDPE. That's the twelve inch right there that we're seeing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Okay. Any questions? It's a little confusing, and I look forward to hearing the repeat of this at our next meeting. <laughs> okay. And the bottom line is the important parts are B. Pardon me, I lost you, Barbara. Hmm? Can't hear Sorry. you. Can you hear me? Some people are frozen. Hmm. Yeah, it it um the the system is not the same since before the storm. Okay. As okay, let, let me let me sum it up in case it's yes, still please. confusing for some of you. So the day the pipe, there was a pipe break. We got a 12-inch HDPE above ground installed mm -hmm. by Andrini, the contractor, who came on the same day and installed it. And we appreciate them. I think we should say that, that we appreciate yes. the fact that they yeah. came and did a lot of work right away in difficult conditions, just as the SAM staff did. And yeah. that, was the, that was the blue one? Yeah, that was the blue one. That was a local contractor who came in 
probably an hour after we um, after the pipe break and everything was in place. So they worked on it for about four days until January 4th, and they fixed the leak and put an above ground 12-inch HDPE pipeline. Okay. Now, in order to they, they cut, they removed the ductile iron pipe and installed the 12-inch HDP at the same location as the ductile iron pipe. So now here comes in another contractor, which is Bay Pacific, and we've given him the task. I mean, I'll take you back. Andrini installed it for about 300 linear feet, only 300 linear feet. Mm -hmm. So here comes in another contractor, which is Bay Pacific, and he, his task was to install 850 linear feet of HDPE pipeline, 12 inch, which will be under the ground. Okay. So in order for him to install the 12 inch HDPE uh, pipeline under the ground, he has to disconnect the existing HDPE above ground 12 inch pipeline. And when we disconnect it, we need service. So we need a bypass line. And that bypass line is eight inch. So that's at above ground, eight inch, um, sorry, that's the eight inch uh, pipeline, which is being installed by Bay Pacific on a temporary basis. So the idea is they're going to have this eight inch bypass and then use it, keep it for a couple of days and then install the 12 inch HDPE, remove the uh, 12 inch above ground HDPE, which was installed by Andrini, and put the 12-inch HDPE underground. So, Gishan, if I can interrupt. So what you're saying is Andrini put in 300 feet, but we need to replace 800 feet. So that's why we're putting in an 800-foot bypass line and replacing the short-term bypass line of 300 feet. That Correct. was short term, above by, ground by, yes, above ground bypass line. So, and then the next thing to do will be to um, install the 12 inch HDPE permanent line, which is has like a much thicker, um, a, a very different outside diameter from these. Correct. And that's the permanent one. Okay. Yes, Barbara, I think you have a question. So for the interim setup, um, why is eight inches sufficient? If, if in case there's a storm or something, we, we have um, assumed that a 12 inch pipe is critical. I'm sure there's a good reason. I'm just asking what it is. I have yeah, a question, Barbara. Yeah, that's a good question. It was because the 12 inch, uh, uh, pipe was not readily available. The delivery was about four to six weeks. So we couldn't possibly afford to wait till that time. And since there's not going to be any storm coming up until the December, uh, until January 30th, we are hopeful of finishing this entire thing before we get the next uh, rainfall. Sure. We had to do something at the earliest and we had to remove the uh, above ground. And so we took a decision and we worked out the hydraulics. We found out that the eight inches would still be okay. So, Kishan, what you're saying is something that we have seen um, in past recent past projects, which is the supply chain is often insufficient to get things done on the engineered timeline, or the or or the time the optimal timeline. So, some things just end up getting drug out because of the supply chain problems. Exactly. I mean, just to uh, let you guys know, um. We placed uh, an order on a generator, which is a standard generator supposed to be off the shelf. And we we ordered it in July after the board approved the budget for 22-23. Um, and looking at the supply chain management issues, a standard off the shelf generator ordered in July, we're going to get it only in February. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm glad it's coming. So Yeah, so it's eight months for a standard of the shelf generator, it's not customized and we don't have to do any installing. So we just probably will plug it and a couple of electrical wiring, but not nothing major. So, so you're, you're, how long would that have taken under 
uh, say, past supply chain before the problems? A, a month? Probably one month or two months, probably max. Yeah. So, so what I'm getting at is our capital improvement program has got a lot of equipment, pumps, maybe customized equipment, because we have to match the pump curve, the head loss curve, a lot of other things, which it has to match to our specific location, because we're trying to uh, install it in kind, probably at the same location, replacing the existing ones. Number one is supply of the equipment. That takes a long time because we have to go through the submittals. The manufacturer has to submit drawings. We have to evaluate the drawings and then give them approval to go ahead and start manufacturing. That takes a couple of weeks. And after the drawings are approved, the plans are approved, then they start the manufacturing, which takes a lot of time. And after the manufacturing is done, once they supply the equipment, then we have to get hold of a contractor to install it. So all this takes a lot of time. And that's why the CIPs, you see, some of the CIPs, at least 22, 23, have all, all the POs, purchase orders have been issued to, all, to almost all of them, I think, although we are not evaluating the um, consent agenda today. We are not going through the consent agenda, but I have that sheet there. While 22, 23, we are still getting quotes. Some of them are manufacturers are hesitant to even up, give us quotations because they're not sure about the price. They have, they're waiting for suppliers overseas to give them details. So we are trying our best. I just wanted to say that's the scenario of the CIP. It's not that staff is not putting efforts or it's not that uh, you know the management is not serious about it or anything like that, but it is, it is what it is. It's a supply chain management. It's not only with SAM. It's, right. it's a problem everywhere, all over. You ask anybody, you try to get anything standard, that takes six to eight months. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Matthew. Matthew. Uh, I don't know if this has anything to do with the, the crisis caused by the storm, but uh, I wrote a note. I don't, I think I could, this came out of one of the daily uh, summaries. Uh, the Princeton pump station pump two has a, had a leaking seal and a temporary rental swing pump ha has been installed. Um, with, is, uh, we have to replace that pump station in a little less than a year and a half. Uh, will that uh, temporary pump, swing pump, whatever that is, uh, be in place that whole time, or do you plan to fix the uh, leaking seal in existing pump two? And if, if it's the latter, does that mean that the, that pump station will have to be taken out of service for a time? You want me to answer that, Kishan? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, the uh, the temporary pump that's in place right now at Princeton as a temporary measure so that they can get the seal. It's a mechanical seal that they're replacing on the um, the permanent pump. Once they're able to replace the mechanical seal, they're going to reinstall the permanent pump, and then they'll take the temporary pump out. So if that if that pump station uh, if that pump doesn't uh, has to be replaced, it'll only be out of service for a short very short period. It sounds like yeah, it's not a pump; it's a seal. It's a seal that went bad. It's not the pump. Right, but this but you can't use the pump because it's leaking. So. Well, that's why there's a temporary pump in place right now. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Matthew, um, to go further on your uh, question, uh, yes, we are looking at the Princeton pump station. We are, right now, we are working on the plans the, to prepare a bid package so that we can go out for a bid. Because the entire thing, constructing a new pump station, we have to actually go out for a bid. It's a, it's a huge job. Uh, yes. board, yeah, the board authorized 1.2 million. So it, we have to do a detailed engineering, send out plans, and we are at the, we are at the moment of uh, putting together everything and we'll be bringing it to the board for, uh, you know, to, to review the package and then send it out for bidding. We are working on that. Right. You, how solid do you expect that 1.2 million figure to be given the current um, supply chain and inflation problems? Oh, I can tell you right now that that is not going to be adequate because it's, it's going to be the pump plus install. It would, 
but uh, yeah, I, I don't want to predict anything, but definitely it, it would be far more than that. So for planning our upcoming budget, um, we need to look at taking, putting in some um, guesses, I guess is the best word on what things are going to be costing in the future, even for past projects that have been funded. Correct. We've seen that in 21, 22 projects. If you, if you see a spreadsheet, which we gave you uh, in the board packet, Take, take, for example, the aeration basin. We have not even completed the job of the aeration basin. When we uh, went for the budget in 21, 22, we thought 416,000 will be set aside. We had a quotation from EDI and all that, but as we move further, we have come across several things and install prices have also gone up. They've come across several issues in aeration basin three and four put together. So our costs have already gone up by about 46,000 right now, and the job is not even completed. So there is there is overage in most of the projects. Yes, Barbara. Well, that's why I think it's important for, for you to have flexibility in the capital improvement budgets. I mean, maybe maybe there's a mid, mid year review. I don't know. I, I think I agree that we, we shouldn't be locked into rigid numbers and um, sets of projects. And I totally understand the time that it takes to do all these. Um, but it is, I think what we're trying to do is just figure out a way that is effective for SAM management and also, you know, keep keeps has an idea of how the projects are coming and how the funding is doing with respect to the projects that have been authorized. So I don't think we've quite quite solved that yet but I think we're making great progress. And I know you're doing a lot of big, big projects right now, which is a lot to have on your plate in addition to running the plant in this um, complicated time. So um, I think you're doing a really good job of all that. Yeah, and in spite of uh, we having all sorts of issues like the bus duct failure. So that itself is a big project. And, and look at the bus duct failure. We had it in April and we have still not replaced the bus duct for various issues. Eaton, who had to supply the bus truck took months together. They have again supply chain management issues, and then we have we have to coordinate with PG and E was to shut off and do all those things with the transformer, and they we couldn't find a date. So now tentatively it's planned for February first. But look at the amount of time that we waited. Although although Sam board approved it immediately because it was an emergency and we had funds, so we we did that in last April. We had a failure and immediately we ordered for it. And we are not even there yet. We are not even completed. That's that's the that's that's another story of uh, supply chain management issues that we are having. So you're saying that we're we're approaching a year on trying to get the bus duct parts um, to to remedy that failure. And meanwhile, we have well, all I can say is. The budget's going to be interesting this year. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and the bus duct is is not even uh, it's not a it's not like a customized. When it failed in 2017, they customized it for us. They replaced an old bus duct with a new bus duct, so they customized it for us. So from then onwards, it's probably standard because the designs already existed. They didn't have to start from scratch. But well, we didn't get the supplies. They didn't have the material. Well, maybe we need a um, a look at the status of the projects and, and the issues around them at some point. But I don't think that's a high priority right now with all the other things on your plate. But it is something I think the board might might benefit from. Yeah, I mean, we do provide the status on... Uh, no, but, but all the things that you're explaining now aren't on those forms. And I, mean, know, yeah, I can... Um, I can. I can write a one page or a 10 page. Uh, no, page don't do that now, but, but let's figure out, you know, a way maybe a, a six month look at the thing in the future. But I, let's, I would not want you to go back and do that now when you're in the middle of all these other um, issues that are more important. More I, I do appreciate answering the questions tonight. Yeah, me too. And this is um, the reason I wanted to have this get together, Jeremy, uh, 
uh, is this information session was because I think for the public, there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of costs, a lot of parts, a lot of issues. And Sam looks like it's just working just fine. But it it is um, um, doing an extraordinary job in extraordinary trouble extraordinarily troubling circumstances so um yeah i would i would look forward to um these um when we're looking when we're looking at the budget i think it's very important to keep the public informed because often they only hear about the costs going up and they don't understand why and so what are we looking at, um, if you want to talk about it, in terms of um, the ultim- uh, some of the costs on that Montera, the uh, SAM pipeline in named Montera? Um, are we going to, um, we have to replace all the footage of that pipeline, right? Well, can right. we have the engineer's report? <laughs> Next item. Yeah, so maybe we can combine. That's the next item is the is a part of the manager's report if you want me to touch on to that. Please, please. Okay. Yeah, so you already have in your packet uh, the, the report uh, from the engineers uh, meeting, um, which was, I believe, uh, I don't have the date right now, but whatever, it's in your packet. And uh, Sam board actually, uh, <clears throat> in our last meeting on January 9th, we decided that the engineers from the respective member agencies will meet together and then discuss about uh, the force main, uh, or the future of the Montara force main. So we, we've we already had two meetings and the notes of the first meeting is already in your packet. Now we did have a meeting last Friday. It was, uh, it was a bit too late for me to put the uh, notes in the packet, but I can verbally tell you about what was discussed on uh, last Friday. We're actually having a meeting every Friday. We have Mars from, uh, engineer from uh, City of Half Moon Bay. Then we have John Rayner representing GCST, uh, engineer from there, and um, he's from Kennedy Jenks. And then we have Pippin from Newt Engineers, who represents MWST. And of course, me from Sam, who represents the engineer at Sam. So we meet every Friday. And uh, so in our last meeting on Friday, in the first meeting on Friday, it was decided that uh, Half Moon Bay said they would provide an RFP and they volunteered and said they'd provide an RFP for the uh, design of the force main. And then uh, in the last meeting, uh, Half Moon Bay presented a template for the RFP that was distributed to the group prior to the meeting. And the group uh, actually determined that the template was too complicated for Sam's use because it was a template which was used by the city. And uh, I mentioned that we have done uh, these RFPs for firms for the plant upset with Brown and Caldwell, and we've done it in the past for recycled water, and we know we know what all to cover in the in the RFP. So I volunteered and said Sam will take care of the RFP, and uh, requested all the engineers to send the bullet points with comments which need to be included in the RFP, and they are required to send it to me by Wednesday, this Wednesday, and I will put together an RFP and bring it to the SAM board on the February, uh, on the first meeting in February. I think that's February 13th. I'll be bringing it to the SAM board to get an authorization to move forward with RFP. The group also arrived at a consensus that the existing Montana force main needs to be replaced with a new pipe and possibly new location, depending upon the circumstances. Like for example, we have uh, we have a gas lines going all the way, a two inch gas line in certain places. It might be impractical for us to put the, or dig it up and put a put another new pipe at the same location. So we might have to change the alignment a little bit. So mm. so that actually we actually sorry we actually faced that in the present 850 linear feet. We try to put it to the same location and we find that there's a gas line coming. So that's mm. why we change the alignment slightly. A two-inch gas line is coming right uh, above the uh, existing uh, ductile line force main. 
So there could be several things in this entire segment of what we are talking about, 13,650 linear feet. So that was discussed and we said that we will possibly have it, uh, we'll have a new pilot, but possibly at uh, the same alignment to the best extent possible, but wherever not possible, a new location. We also agreed that uh, there's no point in having a temporary bypass for the entire length of the force main, and we'll have to do it possibly in, in various parts, starting from uh, the end of the 850, which we are going to replace. We also discussed at length about uh, revisiting the diameter of the pipe, although half one Bay felt strongly that the diameter of the pipe needs to be changed or needs to be studied, given the flows and pipe pressures that are being... Uh, that were determined during the recent storm event, plus the uh, ADU laws allowing for more units where there could be a correlation to increase flows to the sewers. So there was a lot of discussion on that. Although a uh, consensus was not reached, Half Moon Bay was of the opinion that uh, it might be good to do a study, while Sam felt that if a study has to be made, then we should do a thorough study, including a flow modeling and details, which was done in 2000, because the I and I's have gone up in all the agencies, and that would take a lot of time. And we do not have that much amount of time, nor the money to do all that stuff. So it would be, it would make more samples of the opinion that it would make more sense to install it in kind at the same location, preferably at the same location, subject to alignment like what I've already mentioned, but the same diameter of the pipe, so that we don't have to go through the uh, the coastal development permit. The, CEQA, there'll be so many other repercussions. And uh, Montero, Ma, Christian, Montero agrees with you. Getting this pipe done quickly and within the limits of the current permits is very, very important. We don't want to get stuck with appeals, with expensive studies. And this pipeline, even if we were to increase it, we just replaced the pumps in the Portola pump station and the and the pumps were sized together way back when. If, if we start changing the sizes of things, we're gonna have a very inefficient and prone to failure system. So um, I think that Sam is making the, the, the best choice in keeping it timely, and within the limits of the uh, permit so that it's less expensive. Yeah, but to the best extent, what what uh, we decided or what we discussed was when you change from a ductile iron pipe to an HDPE, you don't get the same diameter. You get the closest diameter. Like, for example, if the ductile iron is, say, 12.1, then the, then the HDPE, you get 12.6 or 12.5 or whatever. You can't, you, you'll either get a, 11.8 or a 12.6. So it makes sense for us to choose a 12.6. I'm just giving you examples just out of the uh, cuff. So if it's a 12.2 ductile iron, we might get a 12.6 or 11.8. So it makes sense to use a 12.6. So to that extent, all permits are allowed. I mean, you're allowed to change that. We had a similar situation at the Granada Force Main and we didn't have to go through CEQA and all those intense uh, um, permits required. And we were able to... Uh, move forward with it. Yes, uh, Matthew, I believe you have a question. Uh, first, I'd like to say I agree with what Catherine just said, uh, at least at, from GCSC and, and my own opinion that, uh, yes, we need to, to uh, be expeditious on this. We should replace it with the same size pipe. And um, and all, uh, as you said, all the studies and uh, other uh, uh, permitting, uh, et cetera, would just take too long. And, and I think we have enough evidence that we need to do the, this pipeline replacement soon. Uh, and, but I, uh, and my question is, does the, this replacement, does that include the portion, the northernmost portion that was done in 2015? Will it be replaced as well? No, it will not be. The Valimar Force Main was recently installed in 2015, and that is a HTPE pipe. So that will definitely not be replaced, and uh, that is that is good enough. That's as good as uh, what is going, what we are going to get in the uh, in future for the uh, for Montana Force Main. All right, good. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? 
Okay, I'll bring an update uh, at the next board meeting, but uh, however, I will also share these updates at my during my weekly report that I send to the board. Wonderful, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I really appreciate um, everybody coming to uh, this gathering, this fun Zoom call and um, keeping up to date. Um, so with that, our um, gathering can recess to the bar. <laughs> Good night. Thanks okay. for all the hard work. Thank you very much. Good night, and thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Okay, all right. Best wishes to those in Half Moon Bay with everything going on. Absolutely, I agree.